Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to church. We are so pleased that you're here. Um, my name is Libby, and with my husband, Julian, I have the privilege of serving as senior pastor here at Sutton Vineyard. Um, as we gather once again together, um, we, have, we are continuing our series, Thoughts of the Faithful. In this series, we are trying to look at three essential qualities that we aspire to embody as a community of believers, qualities that define who we are and how we engage with the world around us. We want to be known for our honor towards others, our humility in our interactions, and our unwavering hope in all of circumstances. While these qualities might already resonate with the fabric of who we are at Sutton Vineyard, um, we hope that this mini s series will serve as a gentle reminder of why they are so important for us in our journey of faith. Through this series, we are looking to explore the thoughts that mould the heart of who we are, focusing on how we extend these virtues towards others and how they shape how we want to be viewed in our community. Last week, Julian shared about the idea of championing the church. If you missed last week, I would really encourage you to catch up on YouTube. He encouraged us to speak well above the churches, to celebrate their victories, even if their flavour is a little bit different to our own. Julian highlighted the importance of modelling our life after the example of Christ, something that underpins everything we're talking about in this series and beyond. Jesus loves the church in all of its diversity and different flavours, the different ways of worshipping and the different ways we might live out our faith. The heart of this series lies in our desire together to mirror Jesus, to mirror Jesus in everything we do and to delve deeper into his transformative power in our lives. This morning, we're going to be shifting our focus towards the idea of humility. Um, but our faith journey isn't something that we do alone, but something we do together and bringing us together as a family. And in this interconnectedness, humility becomes a really important ingredient in our pursuit of becoming more like Jesus. It's not just about adopting a posture of meekness, but it's about navigating our Christian journey with an open heart, ready to learn, serve and grow alongside each other. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Philippian church, speaks a lot about humility. And in his letter, he captures the very heart of humility that um, we would like to characterise our lives. He urges us to look beyond ourselves and to embrace the mindset of Christ, who humbled himself for the very sake of humanity. It's within this framework this morning um, that we're going to look at some guiding principles for cultivating humility in everything we do, in our interactions with each other and other people. And that is the passage we'll be focusing on this morning. As we dig a little bit deeper and explore what Paul meant in his writings about humility, there's some really important questions that we're invited to look at. How do we actively practice humility in our lives every day? Can we foster a spirit of humility that goes beyond our own interests and extends compassion towards others? This morning, I'd encourage you to allow the Holy Spirit to prompt you and challenge you. God's word should change us. So let's have open hearts as we delve into this together. My prayer this morning, that as we dive into this topic of humility, it would empower each of us to walk more humbly, to love more deeply and to shine brightly as we re reflect the light of Christ to a world that's broken and in need. This morning, we'll be looking at Philippians 2, verses 1 to 4. So if you have Bibles with you, feel free to turn to that now. But if you don't, the verses will be shown on the screen, so don't worry too much about that. These particular verses are the, Paul's foundation to understanding what humility means and to guide us how to allow these words to take root deep within our hearts and see it outworked in our actions. Philippians 2, 1 to 4 says this. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, for each of you to the interests of others. 
I can remember one particular time several years ago before Judah was born that Julian and I went out for a day by the beach and decided that it would be a great idea to play a game of mini golf. Now, many of you here are yet to play any competitive game with us, um, with the exception of maybe Hannah and Josh, who saw this the other day. Um, but Julian and I are both very competitive. I think Julian's already shared the story of when he made someone cry playing Monopoly, who, just for the record, wasn't even playing the game. Um, <laughs> But there are certain games that Julian won't play with me because I'll always win. Um, so for some reason, we felt that a game, a competitive game of mini golf would be a great idea for an afternoon spent together. It was an 18 hole course, so it went on for a little while. And to be honest, it was quite hard to tell who was winning throughout this game. With mini golf, we're both equally bad. Um, we're pretty well matched in that sense. Um, but Julian insisted, as he often does, on being the scorecard holder. He likes to hold that power, I think, of making the tally. Um, and as we came to the end of the game, Julian added up the scores and announced that I had won the game, of course. I might have rubbed it in just a little bit and boasted in my success for quite a while. Yet, as it turns out, Julian is much better at mini golf than he is maths. Um, and after 10 minutes of gloating in my victory, of believing I had won, he re-added up the scores and announced that he had actually won the game. <laughs> it was quite a humbling experience for me, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I, I, you know that feeling you get when you realise that you haven't, I don't know, maybe you haven't felt that, but of, of thinking you've won something or succeeded, then realising you actually haven't. And that might be a silly example of moments where a situation or circumstance might humble you. Um, but perhaps this morning you can think of a time in your own life where either you've been humbled or you've watched it in someone else's life. Paul wrote the letter to the Philippians whilst he was in prison. And yet he wrote to the church with great joy and great authority despite his circumstances. Even in the midst of a very particular situation for Paul and the church, his words resonate with timeless relevance for us today, speaking to the very essence of our faith journey and highlighting a challenge to us that impacts all of us in our culture today. This passage begins with a reminder that within the community of believers, each of us share deep connections through our faith. The encouragement found in our unity, the comfort drawn from his boundless love, the fellowship with the spirit and tenderness and compassion that should flow naturally amongst believers. We often have an understanding of the importance of these, and we ha have an understanding that they should be a foundation to our lives. But I'm sure we can also each recognize that to live this way is really quite challenging, and it's countercultural to the way that we are sometimes encouraged to live. So how do we live in a way that's shaped by these values? These foundations lay the groundwork for what Paul is about to unveil, a life marked by humility. Paul goes on to plead to the Philippians to be like-minded and to possess the same love. Now, this isn't a call to uniformity of thought. Of course, we challenge and wrestle with, with scripture and we might have different views or interpretations of what scripture means to other people, both in our community and other churches. Paul isn't by any means encouraging us to lose our diversity of thought but he is offering an invitation to emulate the heart of Christ, a heart overflowing with selfless love and genuine care for one another. In essence, Paul is encouraging a unity that finds its very source in humility. One of the challenges that Paul poses to Philippians that I think offers one of the bigger challenges to us in our current culture is the instruction to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. In our culture, so often, self-promotion and personal gain are promoted above everything else. We're encouraged to, say, to chase success, whatever that means, despite the cost. To trample on others or burn ourselves out, striving for ambition. But Paul presents a countercultural approach rooted in humility. He calls the Philippians and us to a radical transformation of the heart. One that rejects self-seeking agendas and the alert of pride a challenge, and one that I believe isn't something that we just commit to once, but we recommit to throughout our lives. Paul then implores the Philippians to value others above yourselves. 
This is not an encouragement to disregard our own well-being, but a directive to prioritise the needs and interests of others. As I was reading this passage, I was also reminded of the verse in Matthew 22, where when asked what the greatest commandment was, Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind, and to love your neighbour as yourself. To love and care for a neighbour as you love yourself, you must also love and care for yourself, right? There's wisdom in how we care and value others. We want to have longevity in everything that we do. Paul's words are a call to a selflessness, a lifestyle that aligns with the example of Christ, who made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Jesus's entire earthly existence was a model of humility and his ultimate act of self-sacrifice on the cross shows us the very heart of what that means to us. However, it's also really important to differentiate between genuine humility and false humility. Humility is never self-deprecating or seeking validation or recognition. Genuine humility is authentic and it's a transformative quality that flows from a heart aligned with the Holy Spirit. It flows from a heart that's experienced the boundless love of Christ and has been humbled by the realisation of our own brokenness and need for Jesus' redemption. True humility, I believe, flows from a transformed heart, not a desire to be seen as humble by others. Philippians 2, 1 to 4, stands as a mirror that reflects the very heart of humility to us, a heart that mirrors Christ's own. These verses remind me that humility is not an optional accessory in my faith journey, but it's actually at the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. As we read on in this passage, we can see more of Jesus' humility and the model that he sets for us. Jesus is our ultimate example of what it means to live a life of humility. His life shows to us what humility is. As Paul continues in Philippians, he reminds us that we need to have the same mindset of Christ. It continues, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name. Have you ever met someone who oozes false humility? One of my favourite Disney films is Beauty and the Beast. And there's one character in this, um, in this film particularly who just oozes a sense of false humility and it's Gaston. He often fakes humility to gain favour with others but his underlying arrogance and desire for, atten for attention makes this humility really insincere. It's quite an ugly thing to watch if you've ever seen the film. Um, and if you've ever seen this in real life, it, it can be quite painful to see. Sometimes when we think of humility, we think of meekness. That, yet that so often the true nature of meekness is misunderstood. It's equated with weakness. But humility and meekness are not the same as weakness. Rather, meekness is a characteristic that demonstrates an attitude of receptiveness and responsiveness in our relationship with God. It would be perhaps better compared to teachability and willingness to be transformed by God. In our relationships with others, humility and meekness are demonstrated in gentleness and respect for others. When we look at Jesus as our model for humility, we don't see a passive, weak example. Jesus shows us that humility is a strength, an act of choice. Jesus' actions, teachings, and the way he treated people radiated humility. Perhaps the most striking example, illustration and example we can see in the life of Jesus showing his incredible humility is in his obedience to God. Jesus' willingness to submit to God and demonstrate his love for us in such an incredibly selfless way shows the incredible depth of his humility. Jesus' willingness to empty himself, assuming the form of a servant and enduring the ultimate sacrifice to redeem us. His humility extended even to the point of accepting death 
And to me, this speaks of incredible strength, not at all of weakness. Jesus' humility teaches us something both profound and freeing. The impact of, G of sharing the gospel and seeing the love of God shared with others is not dependent on our own striving or plans, but is more dependent on our willingness to submit to God, our willingness to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. The transformative power of the gospel isn't dependent on human efforts, thank goodness, but it operates through the divine work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps align our hearts with humility. Back at the start of the chapter, we read about our unity as believers. And one particular phrase, tenderness and compassion, is one that Paul uses to describe humility. But it's often a phrase used about Jesus's emotions too. The two Greek, Greek words used are particularly poignant to highlight the need to be Christ-like and to describe to us the mission. The first word Paul used is splachna, which we often translate as tenderness. However, the literal meaning of this is really interesting. It literally means inner parts and bowels. It's a felt experience. Have you ever been emotionally moved by something so much that your tummy turns? Like that's the, what this word is trying to describe. Our tummies turn with grief, shock, distress, or compassion. It's real and tangibly felt. The word is used to describe Jesus' emotions a number of times. For example, when a man with leprosy asked for healing and Jesus was moved with compassion. Jesus allowed the things he saw to get to him, to be felt by him. And Paul encourages us to have the same emotions. Being moved with compassion, allowing your tummy to be turned for the brokenness we see, is, I believe, exactly what happens when we pray that dangerous prayer, break my heart for what breaks yours, God. This kind of emotion is the kind that motivates us to serve others, to share the love of Jesus with those around us. The second word that Paul used is oiktomoi, which means pity and compassion for others. It's interesting that this word is far more outward looking, noticing the situations of others. The first word is felt and the second is seen. Perhaps it could be seen to us today as someone else's situation moving me, the other me reaching out to their situation. When we are concerned with unity and like-mindedness, when challenges come and disagreements happen, are we able to recognise our own hurts as well as the hurts of others? In a book I was reading about Philippians by Alan Hall, he, he writes it this way. This pillar of unity comes to us nudging us and saying, I know you are hurting, but so also is your brother or sister. Come out of your own trench and go and sit in his or hers for a while. You might actually see another perspective on it all. Somebody has to make the first work, move and we, feeling wronged, inwardly insist that it's not going to be us. In the greatest separation of the cosmos, we do not find it written that God so loved the world that he stayed right where he was. The biblical evidence is clear on this. God in Christ stepped out of heaven, searched for us, lived among us, and gave himself for us so that we might be reconciled to the Father. Challenging stuff, not easy, but powerful and freeing when we make a decision to follow that model that Jesus lived, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Expressing humility extends to our interaction with others. It asks us to open our hearts, embrace diverse perspectives, and learn from one another. Even the simple yet powerful act of offering a sincere apology reflects a spirit of humility. Jesus' humility is not a sign of weakness, but a symbol of strength, authenticity, and genuine greatness. The reality is, is that unity within a church is never passive and can at any time be fragile. Unity is cultivated intentionally and it needs to be cultivated and is continually worked at by all of us. It's an active choice that everyone makes to ensure that unity in Christ is preserved and strengthened. For the first time in our married life, Julian and I have a garden, and we're beginning to learn how to not only maintain a garden, but to really wanting to see it flourish and bloom. A garden requires tending, watering and nurturing. It's quite hard work, and it needs a lot of attention and intention to, to thrive. And so does unity within the church. SVC is a beautiful place where we care deeply about one another, 
we welcome people and encourage one another. But this is something we have to continually invest in to protect and continue to allow it to flourish and thrive. Each one of us plays such an important part in this, in shaping unity through humility. We honor one another, embrace diversity, and allow ourselves to be moved with compassion for others. Humility is practical. We listen and value people. We speak well, not only of other churches, as Julian encouraged us to last week, but also of one another. We celebrate and champion each other. That's not to say we don't challenge, but we're sensitive about how and when we do that. Humility urges us to be cautious with our words, speaking in a manner that reflects respect, empathy, and grace. I always want to ensure that I regularly check myself so that I can catch early the moments when my motives or attitudes or behaviors stray from that model that Jesus set, because they will. None of us are perfect, but by checking myself regularly, inviting a few trusted people in, I hope that I can spot them before it's too late. Humility goes hand in hand with honesty, vulnerability, and accountability. Humility doesn't diminish our own worth or significance, but it invites us to recognize the worth and significance of others. It's this beautiful and countercultural truth that we are both incredibly significant and incredibly insignificant all at the same time. We have incredible worth, but we are no more worthy than anyone else. The danger of viewing yourself as more valuable than another is that it blinds us to the value of other people. True humility enables us to recognize and affirm the worth in every single person, valuing their contributions and celebrating their successes. Humility in action is at the very heart of unity within the church. Will you take an active part in deliberately choosing humility? Together, we can celebrate and champion each other and have grace for each other when things are harder for others. Recognizing the need for humility in our own world is hard, especially when trends, personal ambition, hype and so-called success at all costs is a pressure that we all face at different times. But this call of humility can provide an anchor to us in the unsteadiness and storminess around us. When we can avoid the hype and embrace the leading of the Holy Spirit, we find, as many of us already have, that our priorities are reshaped. Hype seduces us with the promise of a quick success, of instant recognition, and the allure of being at the forefront of the latest trend. However, these pursuits can easily overshadow the heart of humility. When we prioritize self-promotion, trend chasing, we risk losing sight of our true calling, to live out Christ's love and service. Instead, following Jesus, we are invited into a different path, one that's characterized by a humble surrender, a surrendered walk with the Holy Spirit. Walking in step with the Holy Spirit requires us to be open and to surrender. It's an acknowledgement that our plans, strategies, and aspirations pale in comparison to the divine guidance and empowerment that the Spirit offers. It's not to say that those things don't have value, but that what the Spirit offers us can offer us so much more. Hype suggests that there's a destination, an end goal, but leaves us empty when we get there and find an emptiness. Humility is not a destination to be reached but it's an ongoing journey that requires our constant attention. It's recognizing that even as we perhaps can make strides in humility, there's always room for more. The humility we can cultivate today can become tomorrow's foundation for even greater surrender. In the kingdom, humility is not a static attribute, but a constant and dynamic value that keeps us pliable, teachable, and attuned to God's leading. Surrendering the will, in God, uh, will of God and choosing humility is not easy, and none of us have perfected it. But Paul teaches us in his letter to the Philippians that it's essential for us to embrace. We've spent some time this morning looking at humility, Jesus' model of humility, and what it means for us within the church. But what if we could take this a step further? What if we embraced a radical humility? What would this type of humility look like in our communities in Sutton? And how could humility perhaps be one of the keys we require to see the gospel shared with those around us? Perhaps it's possible that if we could truly grasp this perspective shift that Paul wrote about, we could see communities reshaped, connections deepened, and a passion for sharing Jesus ignited in such a deeper way than we'd ever experienced before. 
Humility within our own circles is so important, of course, but radical humility compels us to stretch the boundaries of our compassion even further, to make the circle wider and more encompassing. When we allow the Holy Spirit to shape us and to grow humility within us, it should overspill into all areas of our lives. It should extend into our relationships with the skeptics, the unchurched, those searching and those who really couldn't give a rip about faith. Those in our families and our workplaces, the kingdom of God should show a different way. Radical humility becomes an invitation, an invitation for others to encounter Christ's love through our actions and attitudes. As we embrace this radical form of humility, we become living testimonies of a love that transcends judgment and transcends barriers. The world is often drawn to authentic displays of humility because they reflect something that's starkly different to the ego-driven pursuits that we often see today. Humility is an act of love for Jesus. In Romans 12 two, in another letter, Paul writes, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. When we allow the Holy Spirit to shake, shape us and walk with us, we experience radical transformation that results in our minds being renewed. Radical transformation is one result of allowing ourselves to be transformed. Radical humility. So let's live this out. Embracing humility, sharing Jesus with people in our lives. The ripple effects of this radical humility can extend far beyond our immediate community. When we embody humility, we contribute to a culture of compassion and authenticity that has the potential to touch so many lives far and wide. Imagine for a moment the impact when people encounter a faith community that not only preaches humility, but lives it out in such radical and tangible ways. As I bring this part of our service to a close, it feels as though perhaps we stand together at a crossroads this morning. Will we step out beyond our comfort zone? The call to radical humility isn't a simple uh, or a good or a, just a noble idea. Paul sets it out as a transformative way of life. It's a commitment, a, con a conscious decision to demonstrate to others the love of Jesus. A love that goes beyond cultural, social or economic barriers. It's a commitment to draw others to Jesus through our actions, towards each other and those out outside of our immediate circles. Are we willing to lift up others? to celebrate them when they succeed? Will we serve others and allow ourselves to have the same mindset as Christ, demonstrating his love to a hurting and broken world? Let us not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. Let's embrace this together, following Jesus's model together. As I invite the worship team to come back up and join us, um, if you're able to, let's stand and we'll pray together. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, may our hearts be open to you as you transform us from the inside out. And as you transform us, help us to be agents of transformation in our friends, with our friendships, our families and communities. Lord, will you help us this morning to choose humility? May our lives be marked by a radical humility that reaches beyond the boundaries of ourselves that extends a hand of compassion to everyone. Help us to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. In a world filled with noise and distraction, let our humility be a resounding testimony of the power of God's grace. Let us seek opportunities to uplift, serve and love those around us. Let us help us Lord, to invite others to experience the transformative love of Jesus. Help us to be vessels of change, instrument of great, instruments of grace, and messengers of love. In Jesus' name. Amen.